Thank you, Kate, and uh, thank you, Matt, as the, you know, the great warm-up act uh, that we have every single year and bring in the energy. Um, so I'm going to actually start off pretty much exactly where Matt finished and carry on that conversation about visibility. Actually, when Jess and our marketing, or director of marketing uh, came to me and said, actually, what is important to customers right now? What is it that customers need to focus on? What is it that we need to make our focus for our customers this year and going forward? And without hesitation, the answer was visibility. Because for me, that is the core element or a core foundational element to security that so often gets overlooked. And actually, we're going to touch upon a few of those or some elements of overlooking that element of visibility. Now, there's other areas as well. We can talk about identity. We can talk about uh, the cloud. We can talk about application security. But actually, at the heart of everything, there is visibility. And actually, it comes into play in many places. We look at zero trust, foundational element, visibility. As Matt said, you, know, you can't control what you don't know about, what you can't see. I think uh, Donald Rumsfeld, if we're carrying on with quotes, you know, is very famous for his, uh, there is the known unknowns and there's the unknown unknowns that we need to be fully aware of. So we need to know what we don't know so that we can protect that. And actually there's different areas of visibility that we can look at. So there is situational awareness. You know, there are things like threat exposure, which my colleague Nick is gonna dive into a little bit later. And then there's also threat detection. So I guess the question is why focus on threat detection around visibility? Actually, it's quite a, probably relatively obvious. And I'll just walk through you know, why I want to kind of focus on that today. So one is actually the threats that we're facing. Actually, we're seeing them being successful over and over again. You know, looking at the most sort of recently, if you look at Lapsus, for example, had a very, very successful run last year of hitting major tech organizations, NVIDIA for a terabyte of data, including source code. I think it was 53 gig of data from Microsoft with, again, source code. Actually, so they were looking at the tech target, tech, tech market and stealing lots of source code and really looking to uh, extort that. And actually, Conti, which you know, rose and then fell, and actually we can talk about a little bit how they fell, and probably because they didn't have visibility. But Conti being very successful two years ago with the Irish Health Service, last year targeting the, uh, the Costa Rican government and bringing that to its knees uh, completely. Uh, and effectively Costa Rica, I say effectively, actually Costa Rica declared war on the Conti group. Uh, and, but we saw them fade from view. Why? Probably because they didn't have visibility and they didn't have control. Uh, you know, a little bit related to the Ukraine war, once the, I think the head of the Conti group uh, pledged allegiance to Russia, their insider threat effectively took that information and, extort, and sorry, exfiltrated it out of the Conti organization and effectively carried out a ransomware attack on their own group. But there's also some other, and I will realize I'm blocking that, so we'll step to one side. Also, some other things we need to think about. Well, actually, we've seen some big events recently. Log4, uh, Log4 Shell, exploiting the Log4J uh, vulnerability. We've seen the SolarWinds solar Sunburst, so we're actually seeing supply chain compromise. So there are other things that we need to worry about, and not just our ransomware actors and threat actors. Actually, if we're talking about threats, we think about our sort of top threats. Ransomware is still the number one. I think that's... Probably most people have a view on that. But the problem is we talk about ransomware, it's a very, very broad topic. I think a lot gets bundled into ransomware. So if we really focus on what the top threats are, it's targeting phishing over and over again. We're still getting hit by phishing attacks repeatedly. It's identity attacks. Again, we're seeing over and over again organizations being targeted through credential stuffing, through brute force attacks, or through other identity-based attacks. Seeing malware still being prolific, being delivered. And actually, if, if we look at targeting phishing, we can chain these things together. The targeting phishing is delivering those identity attacks, either for forcing people to go through to a, uh, uh, to a compromised website so they can provide their credentials, or they're delivering malware into the, into the environment once users are opening those phishing attachments. And also very commonly and increasingly common that our, our IR team are seeing are drive-by down, drive downloads. So there's a lot of threats that we're kind of facing, that all sit under that ransomware umbrella. And actually, we will take it a step further as well. And then we've got our rising threats that I spoke about. So we've got the insider threat becoming a lot more prolific. And actually, again, we can tie that to ransomware. Something that we're seeing more and more is execution of these phishing emails by in insider employees that have been recruited by these ransomware, uh, ransomware gangs. 
And I'm sure that's something that we have a panel coming up to discuss ransomware that they'll dive into a little bit deeper, but very much a, a rising threat that all organizations need to be concerned about. And also, as I said, with looking at things like Sunburst, we've got supply chain compromise, which has slowly crept up to be the thing that we need to be most concerned about, as it's something that we've not had visibility on over and over again. And actually, if we look at Sunburst, and there's a great um, uh, attack path, attack life cycle through that, one of the challenges that we have in defending ourselves against these types of attacks, particularly insider, particularly supply chain compromise, is that quite often, or majority of times, they're a trusted entity acting inside our environment. And that's one of the things that I think we've kind of missed that gap on. You know, we've been very perimeter focused, very, very much looking for the no-knowns, but actually, how do we detect that behavior that's inside our environment? So New Horizons, new challenges, you know, that have also played into this. This is where we used to be, you know, nicely contained within our network perimeter. Uh, and this is where we are now. So we're now spread out. We are now distributed in where our data, our users, our applications. Uh, we've got remote workers working from home. Our endpoints are well outside that perimeter. The question is, has detection kept pace with our changes to our environment? Particularly now, all of our data sat, sits in public cloud environments as we've moved to a DevOps type function. As we've moved our data and our applications into SaaS-based applications or SaaS-based services, where we're handing off that responsibility to a third party to some extent. There's obviously a shared responsibility <coughs> model there. But we're also still in our on-prem data centers. So do we have a collective and whole approach to be able to gain that visibility, to be able to make a impact on our ability to detect and respond to threats? Now, I won't focus too much more on the cloud, um, as Brian will be following up, talking us through the cloud and how we should approach that um, uh, as a topic and as a view of how we secure our cloud environments. But it's also true that we need to start thinking wider about our mobile devices and our IoT, IoT vice, devices, our cyber physical systems as well. So there's a couple of reasons that we need to look at it. There's also some selfish reasons that I'd like to talk through it. Um, you know, as a proud CTO of Integrity 360, last year we were recognized in two of the market guides uh, uh, for Gartner's market guides in the managed security services in our managed, managed SIEM services. Uh, and then this year, you know, very proudly have been included in the market guide uh, uh, for managed detection and response services. And yes, I'd like to stand up here and, and tell you all about that because I'm you know, a proud CTO. But actually the reason why I want to bring that up is because of the process that we went through to be in those guides, which is really pulling back the covers on our organization, on our approach to how we provide visibility to our customers through detection and response services that we went through with Ghana through a series of interviews and, uh, uh, and briefings uh, with their analysts for them to say, actually, do you want these guys, they do manage detection response in the way that the market is looking for, and hence us being a representative guide in those. So what I'd like to do in this is actually start touching down, well, actually, rather than you know, uh, uh, doing the big sell on our MDR service, actually touch down on how do we do it? What are the elements that we needed to consider when we built this service uh, from the ground up? So that you can take that right on and say, well, actually, if we're looking at our requirements to detect, to respond, to gain visibility, what is the approach that we should start taking and what things do we need to, uh, to focus on? So really, what learnings can I bring from the process that we've gone through that you can take away with you to implement your organizations? So before I jump into that, I just want to frame the threat. So build some context here of what a threat looks like. And actually, I'm going to use a real world example that our IR team um, uh, investigated, um, uh, that we can start bringing that to life and say, well, actually, here's the things that we need to concern ourselves about. And then we can also start thinking about, in a cloud enabled world, how, how does that play in? What does that change? What context do we need to start thinking about? And I'm going to touch on this at a, you know, a relatively surface level overall, um, but I see Patrick and our, the other members of our team are in today, so, and I think we're all on the stage talking at uh, one of the uh, uh, panels, so I'd encourage you to reach out to them in the break to understand more, uh, particularly around how to approach instant response overall. So in this case study, our IR team engaged with a consultancy firm you know, around 50 million in revenue, 250 employees, and got hit by the Lockbit ransomware. I'll, drive, I'll dive down into the details in a second, but an overview, you know, we're looking at a two-month process for that this has occurred overall, so that's our dwell time. I think a lot of time we see our uh, analyst report saying dwell time is in the 250 plus days. Actually, quite commonly, it's 
not actually even that high. You know, I think that's you know, an average of some very large breaches. Um, but if we look at the, uh, 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 the more micro level with you know, what IR, our, our IR team is seeing, it's actually quite a lot less than that. And actually, if we break this down, we can actually see there's two elements to it. We've got the initial access elements of that uh, attack, which is something that most likely was done by a remote access broker. So if we look at that cyber criminal or cyber crime uh, chain, you know, they have a supply chain for themselves. We have the remote access brokers that are establishing that foothold, and then they're handing off to the other ransomware gangs for, so they can hand off. So they're selling that on as part of their chain. So that's, you know, if we look at that, it's an overall a two-month process. But actually, when the real attack happened, we're actually seeing that within three days, so happening extremely quickly. And importantly, to look at the impact. So, and we'll touch, and I'll dive down into where the visibility was lost. But in terms of impact, you know, days of outage, and also through lost business and reputational, we're looking at about 7.1 million cost. How do we know that? Because that's what was reported back to us uh, from the customer. So if we look at the timeline of these events, we can see that, yes, in this instance, there's a drive-by malware incident, as I say, something that we're seeing on the rise from our IR team, and actually quite sophisticated. So the end user was looking up a search for a particular term as part of their normal job role. Top result on Google, legitimate website, click that. Well, actually, do you know what? That was a compromised website. And that compromised website took them off to a, uh, another compromised site, so the delivery site, which then fed them exactly what they were looking for, a file name saying the exact search they'd looked for in Google. So actually what that means is actually compiling that on the fly, on the go, compiling that uh, uh, piece of malware into a zip file and handing it to the customer, uh, to the customer, well I suppose it is their customer, and, it, and adding it or providing that to the end user. They're opening that, that's executing on their platforms and establishing that uh, foothold in the environment. So what does that foothold look like in this instance? And very commonly, you know, Cobalt Strike, great uh, tool set out there, you know, really developed for pen testers, but uh, uh, utilized by um, uh, uh, the hackers all the same. Um, so you know, the, those tools are being released. And it's actually quite common that people give backlash to researchers that are releasing these tools because they're actually just adding to the, to, to the problem. Um, but that's just the way uh, of the world. So once that foothold is established, that's pretty much the end of that process. And then we go into the actual compromise elements. So in terms of this compromise, and I appreciate this is a talk about visibility, and I'm quite happy to talk about this in more detail afterwards or during one of the breaks, if you want to go down to some of the, uh, uh, the lessons learned and things that they could do about different from a prevention and protection point of view. But at this point, once we've got the manual steps, and that's the last three steps that we have up here, we see them executing, gaining privileges, and moving around the environment as a internal user. So once they've compromised a single user, then they're free to move around. And that allowed them to, actually they encrypted all of the VMware because VMware was joined to the AD domain. Um, uh, so just to, I will give one tip. If your, AD, if your ESX hosts are joined to your AD domain, either look to unpick that, or if you're a large organization and need that uh, central user control, put it in a separate AD forest so that you can't get your user uh, uh, your users compromised that's going to allow them to move straight into your ESX server because that means they can just encrypt all of your disks, turn them off, and you're ransomed. So extremely quick, and that's exactly what happened in this instance. So what is the challenge here? Well, from a visibility point of view, and the challenge for that organization, they didn't have visibility of the start, the middle, and they got visibility at the end. That's not where we want visibility. The end being there is a uh, a background provided to all of the uh, encrypted laptops to say that you're bricked, and here's the ransom note. That's not the visibility we want. We need visibility much further in the, uh, in the chain. And actually, we can represent that nicely in the unified kill chain. So this is bringing two um, of the uh, sort of leading frameworks together. So if we look at the uh, Lockheed Martin classic kill chain, really updating that and in embedding the MITRE attack framework into that. If we look at that process going round and round as we go from that initial foothold, network propagation and actions on, on objective. So we need to make sure that we're bringing visibility to each one of these steps. So at the initial foothold point. So when we're seeing users being targeted at the endpoint. So do we have complete visibility in that endpoint? Do we have EDR telemetry? Do we have telemetry from that endpoint feeding into a platform that we are correlating that data on to be able to identify it? 
So we're going to touch into how does this affect cloud. Well, actually, it does change things ever so slightly in the cloud. Commonly, in the cloud, people won't have EDR running on a lot of their workloads. It might be because they're serverless. It might be because they just don't want to include an EDR platform on there. You know, many organizations have gone through that sort of lift and shift up into the cloud, and now I'm picking that to make it more cloud native, putting it into containers. Are they monitoring all of that? I'll tell you one of the, if we look at cloud, and I'm sure Brian will touch upon it, with some of the tools that can help us with the, uh, defending the cloud or bringing that visibility. Things like being able to monitor containers, things like being able to monitor the environments. And actually, we look at some of the uh, attack vectors in the cloud, you know, how do we protect that control plane uh, over and over again? And then actually, still, in the, if we apply to the cloud, you know, that's just getting that initial foothold in an environment. If we go through to the, the real steps where an attacker is navigating around the environment, we still need that visibility. So are we collecting that telemetry in the cloud? Are we collecting that? in our environments, particularly from a network perspective. And I'm sure uh, you know, our partners, Darktrace, with us uh, here today, they'll be able to talk through that as well uh, to, a, to a good degree. But do we have that visibility of what the users are doing? Do we have that visibility of the endpoints? Do we have that visibility uh, of the network? And then lastly, you know, the point that we don't want to be in once that has happened and once the, we're seeing that uh, uh, action on objectives. So how do we need to approach this? So I've touched on a few elements uh, there. Um, but how do we need to sort of build modern, uh, modern, modern threat monitoring? And I've put the subtext there, detection and response, and actually for a very good reason. So if we look at a SOC now, we can actually start splintering out our elements of a SOC. This is a SOC platform model that, uh, that Gartner use. But actually, what they focus on is being a key element that's almost um, uh, self-sustaining and, and separated off is the monitoring, detection, and response. And actually, when we talk to analysts, and when I talk about analysts, security analysts now, you know, they don't want to be known as being part of the SOC. They want to be known as we're part of the detection and response team. So separating out of those duties and starting to focus on specifically having a pure capability around detection and response. So being able to understand the threats that we're facing and being able to respond to those threats. So we take a security first approach overall. Um, uh, so some might have seen the security first model uh, and the way we approach it. Um, and actually, this is what we applied when we were standing up our managed detection and response service. So what was our process of going from where we were to be able to deliver a managed detection response service that Garden recognized uh, as, uh, in the, uh, the market guide? So we go through a process and a mature process of saying, well, actually, we need to first identify and assess where we are. What are the threats that we're facing? What are the gaps? How can we make sure that we are on top of those? And actually, from a detection response point of view, how do we, if we're under, do we understand what we're defending? And are we, uh, are we sure that we're able to spot and mitigate threats as they occur? We need to protect and prevent so as much as possible. Probably not purely uh, applicable in terms of a, uh, a detection and response piece, but obviously as much as possible we want to prevent up front. And then we need to make sure that, you know, understand that we're not going to prevent 100% of threats and that we are going to need to then have a follow-up process that is looking for those threats that have passed through our defensive layers and make sure that we're able to detect and anal analyze and importantly being able to quickly respond and recover so can we recover from those threats and making sure that is a constant wheel that feeds back all the way through so a constant loop uh, that's feeding back in so that we make sure that actually what our lessons learned are going to go through and uh, uh, impact and influence our ability to identify and assess. But another way of looking at that, and the way that we kind of look at it when we're standing up the SOC, SOC, we're standing up SOC our detection and response capability, so it's easy to, to get the term slightly wrong there. We can look at actually what do we need to do pre-incident. So what are the actions that we need to be taking before an incident occurs on an ongoing basis? And that's really covering those top two areas. What do we need to do peri-incident? So during an incident, what are the things that we need to be doing to make sure what are the capabilities that we need during that incident so that we can mitigate and contain as soon as possible. And then also post-incident. So what do we need to do post-incident? So pre, peri, and post. They're the things we kind of need to focus on. So that's how we sort of started focusing on building our processes and our approach to uh, our detection response capability. So in terms of pre-incident, threat intelligence. So do we understand the threats that our customers are facing? Do we understand the tactics, techniques, and procedures? that attackers are using, because without having that awareness, we, we, we don't know what, what we're defending against, we don't know how to detect them, we don't know what we're looking for, particularly in terms of our processes. So do we have a process that is going to ingest threat intelligence 
IOCs, yes, I, you know, I always talk about IOCs being great, but they're indicators of somebody else's compromise, not your own. What we want is actually the, uh, uh, the other side of threat intelligence, which is the tactics, techniques, and procedures. So do we have that process that's ingesting that and making use of that data to further enrich and to further enhance our capability? Do we have a security engineering capability? And by security engineering, do we have that process that is going to maintain the effectiveness of our tools? If we look back at that um, uh, example of uh, uh, the incident that uh, our, our team had responded to, we look at one of the mistakes that, that they made was down to not having, they had great tools in place, industry leading tools, but they didn't have the coverage they expected or thought they would have, and they didn't have the policies in place that they needed through oversight. So do we have that process is constantly maintaining and maximizing the effectiveness on our tools on an ongoing basis? Do we have the ability to build? So if we're consuming that threat intelligence and it's telling us that these are the tactics, techniques, and procedures that our customers are facing and that us as an organization is facing, do we have that ability to turn that into threat content so that we can actively go out and detect those threats? So do we have a detection engineering capability? And then lastly, do we have a process to continuously test it? So these are things that we need to be doing pre-incident. So we need to make sure we've got the, our situational awareness. We need to make sure that we're looking after the tools and making sure that we have visibility into their effectiveness on a constant ongoing basis. Far too many incidents that our guys uh, respond to could have been prevented if the tools were deployed correctly, configured correctly by the end customers, or had the coverage that they, that they needed to be able to detect or respond to that overall. And just that last piece on continuous testing, you know, I can't talk about it enough. You know, it's, you know, it's not just getting a view of this is where we think we are, but are we engaging red teams? Are we having a purple team exercise to make sure that we're actively testing what our defenses are and are they effective? And then we look at what we're doing periodically during the incident. So some of the very obvious ones here, are we doing alert triage? I'd hope so. I think that, that, that's, a, that's a basic um, uh, that, that we've been doing for a long time. Are we enriching the alerts? So are we bringing all that contextual data as quickly as possible to an alert, particularly before an analyst even looks at it? So are we saving ourselves time and effort to make sure that we are focusing on the things that really matter? And we need to do our incident analysis. Again, very obvious. But we also need to have our containment actions. So if we talk about processes, do we have a process? It's great that we might have a tool. We might have an EDR tool. We might have a, uh, we might have a firewall where we can block connections. But do we have a mature process that we can rely upon, again, that we've tested, that when we need to take containment actions, we know to, who to communicate with, we know what actions to take, um, uh, and we know how to recover from it at the same time. So is the process that we have in place. Do we have it documented, and do we have it tested? And also, we need to be proactive. So start looking into threat hunting. You know, it's, it's all well and good that we deploy tools, uh, and you know, great and effective tool sets to uh, our environments to be able to look for suspicious behavior, but actually we can't sit there and wait and be reactive to what those tools are telling us. We need to be proactive and start hunting for those threats directly. So having a process. And what does that process need to look like? Well, actually, we need to look at the, some of the anomalies that maybe haven't surfaced up to be an alert for our teams yet, so particularly where we're seeing them a large number against a specific host, but also are we taking those tacks? So again, pulling on that threat intelligence as it comes through, are we looking at the tactic techniques and procedures, and then building searches to be able to go and hunt for that particular uh, threat that may be occurring in our environments. Good examples of that, Log4j, Sunburst, so taking those IOCs and being able to very quickly look, are we vulnerable to it, and are we being attacked by it on an ongoing basis? And then there's the elements that we need to have in place for post-incident. So we need to be prepared. This is really being prepared. Do we have that uh, preparedness to be able to respond? Do we have that ability that when we have been breached, we can get forensics analysis? We can go through the steps confidently to eradicate them from the environment. And actually, some of that preparedness is, is about visibility. You know, our, our team you know, worked with a, a very large organization uh, through a very painful incident. And one of the things that really challenged them, you know, we've gone, you know, they didn't have a lot of these steps in place, um, but one of the things that really hindered them was when we were doing the eradication. Did they have an ability to eradicate? So that's some of those containment actions. But did they have the visibility in the environment to confidently say that the threat has been removed, has been contained, and we can now move back into normal operations? And that was something that couldn't be answered. And actually, in that instance, 
the customer had to then invest hugely as a knee-jerk reactive process to build, to, to acquire and implement tools on the fly while they're still firefighting that incident so they could answer those questions. So again, that visibility is key when we're looking at eradication. And then being able to do root cause analysis. So part of this really, do we have an incident response process? Do we have the people? Do we have the teams to be able to, to carry that action out? One of those processes I talked about detection engineering. I'm just going to touch very briefly on kind of you know, how do we approach this. And this is part of, if I actually just jump back to this one very quickly. You know, really what I would, you know, that left-hand column, you know, really that's about continuous improvement, uh, which is something we have to bake into our approach and our process for delivering our service. And any SOC service being stood up needs to have a continuous improvement process that is going to make sure that we are able to detect, respond. Um, and we have the coverage that we expect. And how do we do that in terms of detection? So I said we've got that threat intelligence coming through into our threat content development team. And actually, this is what's changed in terms of the cloud. If, you're, if you don't have a seam right now, you know, probably the question is, should, should, do, do we need a seam? You know, that, that's probably a, a whole topic on, on its own. Uh, you know, there's you know, cloud log management solutions that are coming to the market, probably not at the level of maturity that a seam can provide right now. Um, so I'd start and just say, do you know, have you got your logs? in one single place. Um, but if you haven't got a seam, then maybe that's something you need to think about. If you have got a seam, I'd ask the question, do I have an on-prem seam or do I have something built into the cloud for that cloud scalability and cloud agility? Um, and I'd you know, highly recommend looking actually migrate into a cloud seam because then it means that we can start building into these DevOps processes to make sure that we have that agility to deliver threat content on an ongoing basis. So our teams will build threat content. They'll take that threat intelligence from uh, 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 from our threat intelligence uh, partners, those tactics, techniques, and procedures, build the detections, deploy them in YAML, or build them in a YAML format that goes into our uh, uh, deployment server to be recoded into the specific platforms, then tested on a constant loop. So part of our continuous testing is prior to deployment, but also testing our efficiency after deployment through that <coughs> continuous testing process, We're testing them against things like Mighty Caldera, testing them against uh, the atomic red teaming, and then once we're confident, we can deploy those directly out to our end customers. And that means that we've got a constant flow of detection content and detection capability being delivered to our customers. And so that's another thing that's, you know, if we look at the core components of, of a detection response capability, yes, there's the analyst, yes, there's the containment elements, but there's the effectiveness that's also driven through detection engineering. So ensuring there's a detection engineering capability uh, in place. If we just touch upon technology, uh, so in the last sort of 10 to 12 minutes, I did touch upon some of these elements already. So if we look at technology that we should be deploying as part of a detection and response capability, as I sort of talked about SIEM, yes, critically important. Are we collecting all of the logs from our log sources that are important to us? Do we have a place where incident response teams can look at that data? Are we, are we storing that for uh, the significant length of time that we require for at least a year? Far too many times, you know, and, uh, I can refer back to Patrick and his team you know, having to struggle through incidents where they don't have that visibility that then obviously you know, impacts the, the, the customer even further. And then I'll be deploying an EDR. Do we have that visibility within our endpoints? Do we have visibility for our identity? Actually, identity is critically important in the cloud because quite often that is our, you know, our only point of defense. It's a foundational element now uh, as we're uh, accessing cloud-based systems and cloud solutions. And the only thing that we're using to be able to access those is our identity um, uh, that we need to verify on an ongoing basis. So if, and particularly as we're in an always-on environment, yeah, do we have the capability to look for anomalies um, uh, within that user? And the same within the network as well. And actually, we talk about the network. The network's pretty important when it looks for those uh, supply chain compromises, for those insider risks. It's one thing looking at normal network behavior and trying to build models say, well, actually, you know, I'm looking for someone that's using this living off the land technique or, or this Kerber, roast, uh, Ker uh, Kerber roasting to be able to uh, uh, get themselves a, a golden ticket to move through the environment. Uh, but actually, when it's a normal user, are we actually be able to say, well, actually, that user doesn't normally access that environment. They don't normally access, the, access this, that system. So do we have that behavior uh, um, and that baseline identified? And if I actually go back to incident response and uh, uh, one of those customers that, uh, that had that uphill struggle. It's actually really interesting when we look at the sort of questions that come from the ICO. So once there's personal information involved and you've notified the ICO, then they're not asked questions to understand, well, actually, how serious were you taking your responsibility 
for security. Well, actually, it's not security, it's data. How serious are we taking responsibility for personal data? And one of the things they actually ask is, do you have a baseline of your user activity? Do you have a baseline of your network activity that you can demonstrate to say, well, actually, do you know what? I, I did have an understanding of that. So I was able to look for anomalies that are occurring, and I was able to respond to them. And if not, then uh, you know, that, that just adds to their weight, particularly when they're looking at the level of fine uh, based on what they saw as your responsibility. And I touch upon the cloud, you know, making sure that we have that telemetry. I think we've already touched upon that already. But again, in increasingly important, make sure that we have visibility of what's occurring in those cloud environments overall. And then putting it all together, you know, one of the things I didn't touch, touch upon in those processes that we looked at, what are the processes we need to do? Well, actually, a large majority of those can be and should be automated to make sure that you can scale your detection and response capability. Uh, things like the initial triage, the, al the alert enrichment, but also our response actions, bringing some consistency overall, so making sure that we have that <coughs> automation capability uh, built in. So I've talked about some of the threats, talked about uh, yeah, some of the processes, talked about some of the technology. But then, last but not least, we need to talk about the people. Maybe not these people just yet. And actually, I, I, I fully expect that this time next year, we won't be talking about Skynet, but we will be talking about actually how has things like ChatGTP, OpenAI, Google Bard, how has that suddenly changed our approach to security operations? I'm actually already seeing it in some of our vendors, where particularly in SOAR platforms, adding in the widgets so that you can very quickly pose the question, I've got an alert that's just come in with these characteristics. As an analyst, if you want some help, now, chat GTP right now will give you the view on what to do up until 2021, but I'm sure they'll keep updating the data set as they go. But building those into the platform so we can use that AI across all the data, particularly if we start focusing that on intelligence data, then we'll see actually you know, all those hints and guidance will start coming in. I don't think the human's ever going to go from it fully. We're not going to trust the machines, uh, as we found out um, uh, back in uh, 1994, or whenever that was filmed. Um, uh, but you know, very much, I expect that to start becoming part of our future, particularly in cybersecurity, actually all aspects of our lives. But actually, if we look at the people and the teams, and I think I've probably alluded to most of these, what are the teams and the people and the profiles that we need in our detection and response organization capability? You know, yes, we need to center on our, our analysts, but actually it's then surrounding them with the security engineers, so the SOC engineers that are going to maintain those platforms and make sure that they're looking after them. It's making sure we have that threat content development capability to keep moving it on. So do we have a team that's looking after threat content? Do we have a team that's dealing, or a function, rather than a team or a particular person, depending on your size, that is looking at threat intelligence, feeding it into our threat content developers, feeding it into our analysts so they understand the threats, also feeding it into our customers so they're getting that uh, uh, threat intelligence uh, um, uh, so they can be aware of what they need to start thinking about and guide their security strategy. And then do we have an instant response capability? So if we look at that, that's you know, taking customer success, taking management out of our SOC. You know, these are the teams and these are the processes that we approach and these are the functions that we need to embed in our detection response capability. And then lastly, just uh, uh, before I, uh, um, I've got a little bit of time, but we've got time for some questions. Before I uh, uh, exit the stage left, I just want to touch upon the evolution of security analysts. And this is actually something I've seen change over time. Um, that's probably a little bit of an insulting image, but, um, uh, but you get the, peer, you get the, the, the view that, 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 that us analysts have moved uh, with the times. And actually, what we used to look for when we were recruiting analysts into a SOC, we'd bring people from network security. Why? Because our tool set was firewalls, it was IDSs. You know, we were touching on the sort of network security type events. Then we started bringing in seams, and we started looking aside systems and applications. So actually, the profile changed. What were we looking for in analysts to get the very best? We needed people that understood how Windows worked, how Linux works. Uh, yes, we still need that network knowledge, um, but we started looking for sysadmins. So sysadmins were very much the profile for an analyst. What do we see going forward? What do we look to recruit into the SOC now? Particularly as we're now in a cloud-focused world, and really, that's people with software engineering backgrounds. So a big change over the last 10 years of the profile that we need to look for in our analysts. So anyone that's a budding analyst, I would, you know, you know, particularly as we will be moving entirely into the cloud. And why is that important? Because we need to have the skills to be able to script. We need to be able to understand how the cloud works. And actually, 
if I went back to those different departments and functions, as the SOC changes over time, we will see that they'll start to converge very much and we'll have our detection response teams that will be multi-skilled, particularly as that software engineering capability builds across, so they're able to build their playbooks and go out and harvest data, particularly as we start using big data processing platforms on a more regular basis. Um, and there's an argument actually that we might go sockless uh, completely um, and just having a, a detection response capability and handing that off to infrastructure operations teams. And that's something that will happen most likely in the very future. So very much we're seeing that change into software engineering as being that basis for analysts, um, mainly because our customers now are all in the cloud and we need to understand how the cloud works. We need to understand DevOps processes. And we need to be able to insert ourselves into those to be able to assist our customers and guide them completely. So that, that was it from me. I'd, uh, you know, just, just in summary, I think, you know, I kind of, as I say, we went through looking at some of the threats and really some of the capabilities we need to think about. And really all of those are, how, are driving us to gain more visibility. And if we can look at those visibility elements, as I say, into that pre, into that peri, into that post incident. So if we think about pre-incident, do we understand what we're facing? Do we have, well, and it's not just, do we have a threat intel feed coming in? Do, are we actually ingesting that? Do we have a process to be able to make best use of that? Are we using it to guide us? Uh, and then during, instance, during the incident, do we have the tools and technologies that are going to feed in that information? And do we have the processes to hunt for those threats? And then lastly, post-incident, do we have, again, that visibility? Do we have that rich, deep log information that we need that, of our connections, of our processes, of our user behavior? And then do we have the processes that allow us to make use of that through incident response? Thank you. We do have a few moments for questions. Does anyone have a question for Richard? If not, I've got a question. Anybody? Yes. Uh, if we could get the microphone to you, please. Uh, um, although you could probably project, we are recording it, so please do use the mic. Uh, Richard, um, I don't know if it's possible to go back to that slide with the detailed attack uh, mechanism on it. It was quite a few slides back. But you, you sort of alluded to the answer to my question. But whilst I was looking that, I was the thing I was thinking is, well, did they have a, a really good security tool set? You sort of alluded to the fact that they did. But I mean, I was sat here thinking, did they have a web scanning? Did, did they have a web scanning sort of tool? Did they have an EDR tool? Did they have a, a seam? Had they patched their, their VMware servers? So, so is there any more detail you can share? You know, on I, that? I will share some more detail there. Um, and. So did they have a seam? No, they didn't. They didn't have a seam. Did they have an EDR platform? Yes, they did. They had an industry-leading Gartner top right-hand corner plat um, EDR platform on all their endpoints. Did they have a network detection response capability? Yes, they had a leading network detection response capability. So you might say, well, do you know what? how did this all happen if they had all of these things in place? And actually, it's a great, um, it's a great question because I it's a good answer, really, because although they had these tools in place, if we looked at their, I nearly said the vendor name there, but if we look at their EDR platform they had in place. Come on, tell us which one it was. Yeah, well, there's only a couple that are in the top right-hand corner, and it's very, very top right-hand. Um, <laughs> but uh, they, um, they didn't have the policy set correctly. So actually, they had it deployed everywhere. They thought, great, we're in a great situation. The piece of visibility they didn't have was that security engineering piece that's constantly going, do we have, and have we got a dashboard that's saying, here's the number of clients we're deployed to, and here's the ones that have the policies implemented in. Where, are they, where should they get the information from? Well, the EDR vendor can tell them that. Things like uh, uh, their vulnerability scanning, um, you know, if you're using agent-based, can you see what's on there? Are you getting that visibility that's there? So they obviously had, they, they didn't have that um, hygiene step in there that was able to protect them. And actually, so they say, well, do you know, okay, great. It didn't protect them on the endpoint, but then, do you know, that was just some user that didn't have any access to sensitive information. And there's all these steps going on. So they're on the, uh, the network. And actually, cold strike, beaconing constantly. And as an NDR platform, even if it's just only deployed to look at north-south uh, north traffic and it's not looking east-west, we'll pick that outbound um, beaconing activity. And do you know what it did? And it went to an email box that had been flooded by the, been flooding the team that weren't looking at it, and they had set it to auto delete, or oh, sorry, auto read. So it was putting it off to an inbox, to a separate mailbox, and we're never looking at it. So they'd have invested in these tools. 
that was giving them visibility, but you could say that they weren't using their eyes or didn't have the eyes available to look at it. Um, so if we look at some of the challenges there, yeah, so there was some great information. They had the ability to be able to pr protect themselves. But again, because they weren't logging absolutely everything into a seam, so you know, the NDR product will be able to tell you what happened on the network, and show you the network events. The EDR will be able to show you some of those events there. Um, uh, but you know, if you're not taking that full picture of data uh, into a platform, and, you know, I use the term seam you know, mainly because some of the cloud log management systems quite, aren't quite there yet in terms of their ability, to, yeah, they've got great ability to store data, be able to access that data in real time with very quick results that just don't have the correlation capabilities in place right now. But the important thing is, are you storing that data somewhere so that when it comes to incident response, you can actually understand where the threat is and how we can remove them from the environment. Brilliant, thank you so much. Uh, that brings us to time, so thank you so much, Richard. I do wonder, how many of you are wondering whether or not you're using all of your visibility tools properly right now? Um, I'm sure you're gonna go and check, but thank you so much, Richard, thank wonderful. You.